When I was 14 in the 80s, there were video games. There were things like the Super NES, or not Super NES, but the original Nintendo and Atari and this sort of thing. And we played that thing all the time. But the games weren't that interesting. They were certainly interesting to us back then, but they were sort of limited. You know, Super Mario Brothers, you can only play that for so long. And the original Atari, you know, the Asteroids game, you could only play that for so long. You know, the technology was such that, you know, they were limited in terms of what they could deliver to us. Now, there are games that people can enjoy playing for years. The same game they can play for 20 hours a day for years and enjoy it all the time and play with millions of other people online and have a whole lifestyle based around a game like World of Warcraft or other games like Destiny or these kinds of games that are coming out right now. Call of Duty and this kind of stuff. As a video game player myself at the age of 44, I can say that if I were 14 today, I guarantee you that I would be playing video games for 16 hours a day I, because they're so interesting now. I feel bad to some extent for 14 year olds today because of how video games are perfectly designed over time. They've figured out how to perfectly design these games to appeal to certain people, particularly young people, and to keep and to hook them, right? I mean, that's the whole point. You're trying to deliver something that someone wants, and you're always improving on it, and you're always trying to make it best for the customer. And as a result, we have today games that are just like extremely compelling, and to some extent, you could even say addicting to, to a lot of people. And if you're a parent of a 14-year-old, then you know that, or you likely know, how compelling these games are and, and how how interested people are in playing in playing video games. Not all kids, but, but many of them. And to some extent, it's becoming a problem for a lot of people. It's getting in the way of schoolwork. It's getting in the way of social life. It's getting in the way of hygiene. It's getting in the way of, of being outside and being a normal human being. And it's, it's a problem. So I thought that I would do an episode on this today. And we have a special guest with us, Kristen McGee. She is here to talk about this. She's done a lot of research and is quite passionate about this. And I'm interested in learning what she has to say. Welcome to the podcast, Kristen. Hi, Kirk. Thanks for having me. You are an Antioch grad, correct? From the Couple and Family Therapy Program. I am. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. You are a licensed marriage and family therapist as well. I am, and now, I uh, have a private practice in Puyallup okay. and also in Tacoma. Okay. Uh, I work with couples and... And I also work with adolescents. If people wanted to find you online, they'd, they'd go to where? They would type in mcgeetherapy.com. M-C-G-E-E, -E, right? That's correct. mcgeetherapy.com. Yes, and that would go to my website, and then there's a place you can contact me. Great. So I highly recommend Kristen. She's a wonderful therapist. I've witnessed her work as a student, and I'm sure she's even better now that she's a graduate. <laughs> so she relates well with parents and with teenagers Tell us what you learned when you looked up the research around video games and, and teenagers. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'd like to begin with, I went in trying to find out why so many of my clients over the last few years have been so unable to stop playing video games. And like, why, why was that? And there were certain games that they seemed to play even more so. And not only that, is that I would have, I would work with kids and they would talk about their parents playing and how they had a similar effect. They weren't stopping. They weren't stopping to make dinner. They weren't stopping to interact. And at the time, I didn't think a lot of it. I thought, oh, they're adults. You know, they can handle it. Um, this was probably two years ago. And I've sort of watched this um, progression of how people's lives seem to be um, distracted by video games. And I was curious, I mean, it's one thing to tell kids, hey, stop playing, you should only play two hours per day, or, you know, you you're, you tell them one hour of video games a day. But the reality is Kaiser Permanente did um, a study, and they said most children um, play about seven and a half hours of some sort of electronics per day. The average age of someone who plays video games is 33. So when you take a look at those numbers, we have a lot of people doing electronics, not only adults, teens, and young children. But there's something special about this sort of um, adolescent time where people seem to be even more compelled. And we also know the fact that um, people in that age frame, under age 30, 80% of addiction begins under the age of 30. So 
you know, I wanted to know the connection or if there was a connection between game playing addiction and the fact that these kids are so young. And, you know, the last thing we obviously want is um, to have children start having addictive problems at age 13 and 12 and 14. Um, so I did look at the research. And then what I did is I decided that I wanted to go and take a look at the brain research and see what was different. And also really what is an adolescent? Um, I chapped into Dan Siegel, who's out of UCLA, and he defined adolescence as being 12 to 25. And between those ages, something really special happens to the brain. Um, the dopamine um, changes, the levels of dopamine, and there's also something called pruning. And I'm not going to talk about pruning right now, but I really want to focus in on dopamine. Because um, as you know, Kirk, dopamine has a lot to do with addiction. Yeah. Um, so when they were doing the brain research, they discovered that between 12 and 25, dopamine levels begin to decrease, like the average resting rate is lower. So there was another researcher that came in and said, okay, we're going to you know, take a look at this, and they used sugar. So they gave young children sugar, adolescents sugar, I think, they could, I think they used somebody like in the 14 age range, 15, and then they gave an adult sugar. And then they monitored with brain scans their um, dopamine surge. So the little child, um, dopamine rate went up a little bit. The adult went up a little bit less than the child. And then they took a look at the adolescent. The adolescent with the sugar skyrocketed. Um, and so... That was just one of you know many studies I was able to look at, but I found that kind of interesting because what what Dan Seelman brought away from that was, hey, you've got kids when they hit this adolescent time, they are more emotional than your five year old. They are less, um, they're not um, able to manage that because they're having these really huge surges of dopamine. Yeah. Um, and then the second part, there's actually three things that was interesting, is the low level of dopamine of adolescents. So, I mean, you talk to parents and you'll get a you know parent in with a 13 or 14 year old or a 12 year old and they're like, my child is bored all the time. Is my child depressed? You know, what's going on with my child? Well, when I took a look at this, I was like, oh my gosh, these kids' dopamine levels are low. They're bored. They're actually bored because their dopamine levels are at this lower level than your child. So the kid that used to love to play games with her parents or go and do an activity that thrilled them at nine, at 13, they look at their parents and they're like, I am bored. Mm. And the parent's like, oh, you are so defiant. Mm. Mm. So <laughs> I don't know if you've seen these kids or not, but um, so then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what would happen if your 13 year old understood that the fact that their dopamine level is lower and that's their reward center? And what would happen if the parent all of a sudden knew this was coming, right? Right. That changes things, yeah. right? Yeah, it changes their perspective. It, given a, the biological reality, it helps parents understand their children better instead of seeing them as defiant or they're choosing to be a jerk face. Right. That their biology is such that things just aren't as exciting to them as before. And when something is exciting to them, it's very exciting to them and right. very compelling to repeat the behavior because dopamine has to do with motivation mm -hmm. and habit forming and that sort of stuff. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. And it kind of makes sense when I think about myself as, a, as an adult now. It's hard to get me hooked on things. It actually, when I think about video games, there's all these, like Fallout 4 just came out and it's, it's huge in the video game world that Fallout 4 came out. And I want to like it, but I just can't get into it. <laughs> but I guarantee you, if that game came out when I was younger, I would be playing the crap out of that thing. But in my old age, it's just, it's just like, it's hard to, to be addicted to something. I, I kind of want to be a little addicted to video games, you know, like, because <laughs> it's fun to like really go into something. But I haven't had a video game in years that actually compelled me in that way. That, that was interesting to play. It's more just kind of like, yeah, I'll do this thing that's just kind of fun for half an hour and it's not that interesting. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear you say that, that as an adult, our brains are such that where new things don't I mean, the implication is that when we experience something new, the dopamine doesn't spike the way that it does when we're younger, and therefore, it's not as compelling. Dan Siegelman does talk about that, and he said, as adults, uh, as adults, parents of adolescents, 
adults can sometimes maybe um, envy that passion that an adolescent has because they've lost that ability to have passion. So then it's kind of like, how do we tap into that again? How do we get that real excitement? So um, the one thing about these huge high dopamine spikes that are really wonderful and we want our kids to have those is because that is what helps push these kids out of the nest. So they are novelty seeking. They're looking new for new experiences. And these new experiences create these huge dopamine surges, which is very rewarding and pleasurable. So if you have a kid who's, you know, 17, 18 years old and life, you know, mom's making dinner, you know, they, you know, they go on lovely vacations, you know, love, you know, nice home. Um, that child may not ever want to leave, right? <laughs> but our brains aren't, they don't work that way. That becomes very boring. That becomes very low dopamine, not a lot of reward. But all of a sudden that seeking to go to college, um, having our own home, having our own cash, having the own ability to have a car, those, um, those surges in dopamine gets gets us moving and probably at, you know, 44, you don't need to be moved so much. You're kind of where you are. So, you know, <laughs> you don't need to have that giant um, dopamine surge. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer that we don't have that anymore, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot less chaotic. Let's just put it that way. Oh yeah. Can you imagine what it must be like for a 14 year old kid that three years ago playing Monopoly with his parents was the best time he's ever had. And then all of a sudden he wakes up and everything is boring and they look at you and they go, I am so bored. <laughs> Yeah. And you're like, well, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where I began my research. And I, I watched a lot of his lectures and I read his books and I kind of, I, I felt like if we're going to talk to parents and adolescents, we really need to know what's physiologically going on with these people. We need to know what is the purpose of this because then instead we just get a bored kid and then we get a kid who's overly emotional. But if you know that there's actually a purpose to development and that these things are really important, then it isn't so hard to deal with the bored adolescent or the overly emotional adolescent. Well, it's, it feels better, right? You don't take it as personally or, right. or you don't pathologize your children as right. much. But what are parents to do in these situations? Well, I mean, I, I, what are they to do? Well, like they have a kid who doesn't want to play a monopoly with them anymore. Right. Doesn't seem to be that interested in family stuff is extremely interested in playing video games. They right. say average seven hours a day. A lot of parents are dealing with kids that that's all they do all day long, all Saturday, all Sunday, they're online. You know, it, to some extent, it's social because you're playing against other people and you're chatting over over voice and this kind of stuff. But that's all they're doing, sitting in front of the TV playing video games all day long. What, what do you say to those parents? The people who are contacting to get help for addiction, those are the people who are playing these MMO games. It's the number one group of people who are seeking help. Uh, a lot of the games are coming to the point where you... you, you pop those little headphones on, you talk to your friends, and you're all of a sudden um, interacting with people from not only your neighborhood, your school, your country, another country, and you feel very connected, and you're all working together for a common goal. That sort of surge and charge that these kids are getting is causing them to want more and more and more. Uh, the similar, they compare it a lot to gambling, like another sort of process addiction, is that these sorts of rewards that they're getting is so compelling that they just want to play more and more. There's another game. Okay, we're going to work together and we're all working for a common cause. Those all sound really good as a parent because you think, oh, they're being so collaborative. Well, little did you know that that dopamine surge that those kids are getting is so intense. And they're right. an adolescent, so they want more and more. Yeah, but as a family therapist that's been in practice for 20 years, I can tell you that trying to get a child to do something that you want them to do at the age of 13, 14 is extremely difficult. And quote unquote, limiting their video game use for a lot of parents is somewhat of an impossibility. And, and, and I've worked on, you know, micro level with parents on this, you know, and there's various different techniques like... I've had parents, not at my recommendation, but they come up with this and, and then I work with them on it, is they will hide the Xbox or they'll put the Xbox controllers in a safe or they will take the computer monitor with them to work or something as, as the only way they can exert some kind of control over a child's usage of screen time, do you know? And this can be met with extreme hostility and resistance on the child and defiance and anger because that's their sole focus in life for whatever reason. And 
kids don't necessarily take direction. There are some kids that will. If they, you said, look, you know, I want to, I want you to limit to one hour of Xbox. You know, some kids are great and they'll okay, you know, and they might complain a little bit. But 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 the ones that come into therapy are the ones that aren't on board with that sort of thing. So what do you do to help those kinds of parents? As parents, all of a sudden we seem that, you know, parents are afraid to parent. Kids never need parent more than when a kid is 15, 16, 17 years old. Now they may be pushing their parents away like crazy, but they also need them like crazy. This is when they're learning how to be an adult. This is how, when they're learning how to um, control themselves. Now they may not be the most, the happiest camper to talk to mom and dad about this, but there is a point that, you know, parents do have to step in and go, okay, son, daughter, it's normally boys, but boys, okay, here's the criteria for somebody who has an addictive sort of trait. Okay. You tell me, do you, what, you know, where are you on this list? And kids will tell you, they will look at that list. They may look a little scared and not so happy about it, but you're starting to educate them. And to me, everything is education. It's like we educate not only the parent, but we also educate the kid. So kid, this is what your brain looks like. Okay, this is what's happening with this dopamine. This is what this means. These are the signs of addiction. This is how much is a normal amount to play. This is an abnormal amount of play. How are you doing in school? Okay, so you start having a dialogue with them. So, and if at the end of that dialogue, the only way that you can help this child is to grab those Xboxes and put in a locked closet in your house or remove them or say, we are shutting your account down, period. Because we also you know, know through research that if somebody is addicted to something, if somebody has created these pathways, those pathways can also be pruned away. They're kids, right? So if that's what you need to do, and then you educate the kid, and maybe you slowly bring it back in, or you never bring it back in. It depends on the situation. Yeah, I like that. Talking with kids in an educational way, in a way of trying to help them understand themselves in a collaborative way. I think that's a wonderful approach. I think a lot of parents take the punitive approach or the disciplinary approach, but that doesn't, you know, according to research and also just intuitively given my time with families is less effective than working collaboratively with kids and helping kids figure it out for themselves and empowering them. Because the idea is, is that kids also don't want to become addicted to video games. They don't want to have a problem and they don't want to be depressed and they don't want to be socially anxious and they don't want to waste their time on something and assume that. And, and if you help them and educate them, they will drive the car themselves away from the video games. Mm -hmm. So how do we treat this, Kristen? What do we do? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, we find a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you talk to McGee, the <laughs> McGee therapy .com. Uh, There's lots of therapists in the area. Yeah. Talk to a therapist and start getting an assessment, probably a family therapist, somebody who can kind of take a look and see if there's other things going on, if it's how the family system is working together. Uh, that would probably be your first step. So there was one, one case study I read where a kid had this issue and I believe the kid went cold turkey and then the kid was given, the kid started playing golf and had one other activity. So basically the kid was pruning away the video game reward, you know, that piece of that of his mind or his pathways and he was replacing it with golf and some other activity mm. and he was fine. Right. So this kid was able to overcome it. And I mean, maybe that's the message to parents is, is how difficult this may be. Is maybe what you need to have the discussion is how do we replace it that's going to create a reward? The reward will not be as good as a multiplayer game. It will not. Mm. But the benefits of being able to re-engage in life, to re-engage in the family, have friends, and also have the ability to learn new activities. Right. That's a key element in any addiction treatment is mm -hmm. not to take something away, period, but to replace it with something else. And so that's an important piece. And again, you're going to have to have the child on board with that. And that requires a lot of collaboration. You can't just force something onto a child. Well, I don't know. I suppose you can. But, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but one of the problems I think with adolescents is we consider them defiant anyway in our society. And we sort of like say, oh, well, you know, they're just being defiant. So we're just going to let them go because, you know, I'm tired of dealing with their, with this and, and they'll, they'll grow, they'll grow out of it. And that's one of the things you hear from parents or people in general, they'll grow out of it. But when they actually did a research study, I believe in Korea, it was like 3000 kids. They didn't grow out of it. The kids aren't growing out of this. What is it? I mean, our average age of somebody playing these games is 33. So if you have a 15 or 16 or 18 year old or 20 year old who's starting to play this, okay, there's no sign 
that they necessarily will grow out of it. Some of them will find other things that to replace, like you said, you know, they'll do other activities and that will become so rewarding to them. But there's also the idea that some of these, some of these people will not be able to um, outgrow it. Absolutely. I, I know young men and older men, frankly, mostly men that became extremely addicted to World of Warcraft. And that is all they did. And I was close enough to a couple of these fellows that I could observe them. And they just disappeared for years when World of Warcraft came out. For years, they disappeared. And that's all they did. They would go to work, and they'd come home. And that's, that's all they would do. And they would they would come out to go to the bathroom or they'd come out and make, make a hot pocket and go back in. And that's all they did. And, you know, I'm just sitting as an outsider, just thinking, Hmm, that seems like kind of a boring life or a lame life to live, but eat to each his own. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that these individuals were not, I know one guy was definitely after breaking free of the video game addiction, looked back at that time as a pretty dark period of his life where he was very depressed and suicidal and extremely low self-esteem. And just like in this, in this hole and this pattern of yeah, waking up, just playing World of Warcraft, just getting by in a haze almost for some, for some of these people. So mm-hmm. yeah. And, and it's not, again, the video games, it's the whole person. It's, their self-esteem, it's their depression, it's their social life, it's their support system, it's what other activities they have available to them. It's the whole person. It's not just like, hey, stop playing World of Warcraft, you know. It's how do they feel about themselves? How do they interact with other people? How do other people support them? And the whole picture. It requires a lot of, of holistic thinking regarding, rather than just saying, stop playing video games. Right. The problem, I mean, I think one of the issues is that when they get into that dark place, they can't see outside of it. I think with education, kids make good choices. Yeah. But if we don't, if it instead it becomes like this behavioral thing and we're like, you've got to stop, you know, Johnny, you can't do this anymore. Well, the kid's going to go, hey, wait a minute. This is my body or, you know, you you have this, this defiance. Mm -hmm. But instead, if we take it back, to more of an education piece about their brain and biological, then they're they're more apt to go. Okay, I'm listening. Yeah, I, I the as we talk about it, I've never thought about it this way before. But be, again, because of the way that marketing works and trying to sell products is you're continually improving on a product to make it more appealing to people, and as a result, it's more prone to addiction. And the way I see it with with children is if you just let your kids have free access to these these vectors of video games like Xbox or online or their phone or their iPad or whatever, then these these marketers know exactly how to market something, not only to, to kids, but also to adults. And as a person that plays Candy Crush almost every day, I can tell you that that game is like perfectly designed to, to make someone want to play it. And I've, and I've talked about the, the, the sound of the crunch and the music and everything is just like perfectly designed to make you repeatedly play it. So I'm just imagining these young kids, these 12, 13 year olds in their bedroom with their TV and their Xbox and their computer and their iPad and just being bombarded with essentially cocaine and heroin and alcohol and caffeine and cigarettes. They're just being fed this stuff on a platter and no wonder they're becoming addicted to it. And if, if someone came into your house and went into the bedroom of your kid and started giving them cocaine or cigarettes or got them hooked on gambling or something, you'd say, get out of my house. You can't come into my house and do this to my child. They're not old enough yet to figure this stuff on their own. Get out. Well, in the same way, parents need to stop giving children all these screens and all these all this access to stuff, or they need to really regulate it. And I, as I say that, I, I hesitate because it seems like highly controlling. But when I think about how compelling, especially nowadays, these games are to children, I, I think to some extent to be a responsible parent, you, you have to start young, maybe even when they're like six, you have to start like really clamping down. And, and I know some parents will do this. Some parents I know, they don't let their kids have any screen time. They have zero screen time. They don't get to watch TV. They don't, they don't get on the internet. They, they, don't have, they don't have Facebook accounts. They don't have a cell phone. They don't, they don't have anything. 
And that's really hard because 99% of their friends have screens in their pockets and can play the, you know, any video game at all time. And so I just imagine that it's, it's a very difficult thing. But again, it seems like part of the solution is for parents to, to really regulate it from an early age and have a sort of system around that so that the kids grow up within a system in which they expect there to be pushback from their parents on, on certain issues. I agree. I, I think instead of you know being defensive and going, oh, I'm not being a good enough parent, instead of saying, instead saying, hey, gosh, technology, the world is moving so quickly. Um, I think I've got a problem. Um, how do I get help? Because what we do know about brain research is that maybe there is a problem, but it's also fixable and we can re- we can re-basically wire a kid's brain. Yeah, it's a very hopeful message. I like it. It can, I'm sure, seem quite depressing and demoralizing to some parents, but after hearing what you're saying, it, it you know it seems like anything's possible and with enough help and enough effort. And if you go to mcgeetherapy.com, <laughs> you can get the help you need. <laughs> Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me, Kristen. This has been interesting. Thanks, Kirk. And that does it for this episode. Please take care of yourself out there because you deserve it.